No matter what you think about this generation of kids being too sheltered or coddled growing up, one thing has stayed consistent. Everybody gets cuts growing up. Unless you grew up with the parents from the movie Bubble Boy, and in that case, I'm deeply sorry. But here's what's so cool to me. When a cut is going through the healing process, we see only what's on the surface. But there's so much going on under the skin that we don't get to see. And that's exactly what this episode is about. So when we talk about wound healing, we need to keep in mind two things. The first is the time frame of when these things are happening. And if you've had a cut that just doesn't seem to want to close up, you know that these times are relative. The second thing to keep in mind is the actual purpose behind all these chemicals and names. It's super easy to get in this mode of thinking where you're just memorizing chemical names and not thinking about the bigger picture, taking a mangled piece of skin and returning it back to something useful. Okay, first thing, there needs to be some kind of injury to the skin. But that doesn't always mean it's a straightforward cut. It could be something like a stab wound or a paper cut, but it could also be something from the inside out, like a cold sore or a lesion. But your body doesn't discriminate. That wound, like Ryan Gosling in Remember the Titans, is an absolute liability. So once your body has detected a break in the skin, the party begins. And if there's a lot of blood gushing out of a laceration, then the first thing that you want to do is, you know, make sure you stop losing all that blood. Because yeah, getting an infection will kill you, but losing all your blood at once will kill you way faster. So your body's main priority is stopping that blood from leaking, which is exactly what phase one, or hemostasis, is. Chemo for blood, stasis for stoppage. It literally means blood stoppage. Now, if you had a bunch of liquid gushing out of a hose, you'd probably think to cover it up immediately, just like your body does with a blood clot, like a scab. As soon as those superficial blood vessels are broken, some chemicals hidden in the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels, start clumping together with platelets in the blood to make the first part of a blood clot. That's your first line of defense but your body beefs up that plug with a protein called fibrin, which twists and locks together to form a way more stable plug. Once that plug is firmly in place, then your body can start to relax a little bit. It realizes that it's probably not gonna die today from blood loss, but it does still need to deal with the fact that the insides were just open to the outsides. So your body tried to plug up the cut, but for anything that got through in the seconds to hours before the clot formed, our bodies call on our immune system. Phase two is the inflammatory phase which happens hours to days after the event. In this phase, it's all about finding and destroying the bad guys. So you get vasodilation, which is expansion of the blood vessels, and increased vascular permeability. There's a little bit more porousness in your blood vessels in order to let good stuff in. It's at this point that the platelet plug actually comes in handy again. It releases chemicals directly from the injury site to trigger the immune system to get to work. First on the scene are neutrophils, white blood cells that destroy bacteria and do a little bit of picking up after themselves. That's usually 24 hours to three days after injury. Then if it's an easy job and they're not needed anymore, they kill themselves off. They're replaced by some big boys called macrophages, which get in there and keep cleaning up. All while this is happening, these immune cells are secreting cytokines, chemical messengers that tell the rest of the body if the immune system needs some backup. And if that infection is a little bit worse than usual, whether because of more pathogens or because of more dead necrotic tissue laying around, then those macrophages will stay around a little bit longer, just devouring debris. Once the inflammation process is done, that means that those macrophages and a couple other spots in the immune system can start backing off which hopefully means that we're starting to finally return to normal function again. So we start phase three, proliferation or the repair phase. During hemostasis and inflammation, we were concerned with not dying. Did they successfully not bleed out? Check. Did they survive infection? Check. But we weren't super worried about the strength or the appearance of the injured skin because priorities. First thing, you need to fill the wound, literally just laying down strands of ugly red connective tissue. It doesn't need to be pretty, it just needs to be stronger than a scab. With the filling in place, we start tucking the edges of the wound closer together. And once the edges start coming in together in the middle, we start replacing that red gunk with epithelial cells, normal surface level skin. And if the injury is pretty minor, then your body can actually skip the first couple steps and jump right to laying down new epithelial cells. This phase takes anywhere from four to 24 days to complete which seems like an annoying amount of time to deal with a scab, but as far as your body is concerned, that's completely fine. It successfully didn't die, it's just picking up the pieces at this point. So the point of the proliferation phase is really to lay the basis for phase four, the maturation phase. This phase of wound healing is by far the longest part of the process. 
and it's hard to say when it actually ends. It usually begins about three weeks after the cut, but it can end anywhere from like two years later. And it's so hard to define because the scar that's left afterwards will be weaker than the original skin. So it's hard to say when the process is quote, finished. So during the repair phase, your body lays down all those strands of collagen in just a hot mess of a pile. But during maturation phase, your body untangles them to make your skin stronger. When you move that skin, you realign the collagen fibers in the direction you pull, which makes for a cleaner, stronger scar. If you've ever had a surgery and been told to massage the scar afterwards, that's why. You're literally realigning the fibers within the scar to make them stronger. And again, while the scar won't ever be as strong as the original skin, at least now in this phase, it's getting towards where it's going to be. Now, there are a bunch of factors that determine how long this process takes from how clean you keep the cut to how much iron you have in your diet. Either way, I'm extremely thankful for the process that has kept me alive through many times in my childhood and continues to do so. That's it for today. If you learned something, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And would you do me a favor? Share this video with somebody who's always getting cuts and bruises all over their body. It really means a lot to me when you share my videos. Otherwise, have fun, be good, and I will see you next time.